This is your host of Civil One at Erica Kopian, and we have the pleasure of being joined by Emil Sanamian, who's the uh, editor of the Focus on Karabakh at the Armenian Institute at USC. Emil, thank you for taking the time to join us today. Thank you. Uh, my first question is a broad one. Uh, what brought us to this war today, based on your reading and your perspective and your following of this issue? Uh, this is a recurring um, uh, situation. Uh, we've had uh, threats uh, mounting in the last couple of months, uh, from not just from Azerbaijani government, as we're used to over the past couple of decades, but also from the Turkish government. And this is uh, a product, uh, a follow-up on those threats. We see that uh, uh, there is uh, much greater Turkish involvement in what is happening right now. Uh, Turkish uh, drones are engaged, Turkish uh, intelligence is engaged, Turkish propaganda is engaged. Uh, we uh, are in the moment, uh, in some ways, unprecedented. We've never had this degree of Turkish involvement. I've, I, I recently asked this question from the Deputy Foreign Minister of, of Karabakh, and it's something that is not touched upon. To what extent is today's aggression not really related to Karabakh, but has more to do with the crisis, or the internal political, economic, uh, social crisis and the legitimacy of the Aliyev regime. To what extent is this just an opportunity to change the topic from what is on its way to becoming a failed petro state? Well, certainly those things are always connected, especially in, uh, in small countries like Azerbaijan. Uh, domestic agenda, uh, the perception of weakness or strength by, by the leadership is tightly connected to uh, this conflict. This is an identity forming conflict in Azerbaijan. Everybody to some extent is engaged in it. So you can't just say this is just a product of domestic politics, uh, but certainly domestic politics are very closely tied uh, to this situation. And uh, uh, in this particular case, we uh, remember the, the events of July when uh, Azerbaijan came away uh, uh, with a sense of loss uh, from that situation. And uh, they are trying to compensate for that sense of loss with this attack. Uh, we have seen some very strange and bizarre statements from Alayev over the last couple of you know, weeks, and especially the last couple of days, bordering on the absurd about George Soros running Armenia, about the coup d'etat in 2018. Uh, it's almost unhinged to the extent that, you know, he's, he was always, uh, uh, he never used rhetoric like this. Uh, there's sort of a historical parallel with this. I mean, he's, 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 this sounds like rhetoric from like the Nasser of the 60s. Uh, where does this come from? Does this come from a position of weakness? Uh, why, why this turn of event and using this kind of, uh, these kinds of lines, which frankly have no legitimacy outside of his own internal circles? You know, uh, this situation um, uh, has, uh, of course, uh, been very peculiar with the coronavirus. Uh, especially, uh, Ilham Aliyev has been in a sort of a bubble in the last, uh, I would say, uh, what six months that it's been going on the the pandemic. Uh, he has been has had very little contact with a lot of people. Uh, you know, he's al almost always talking over video, and uh, uh, as most of us in a way. But uh, he is, uh, of course, running a country, so he is in a position of uh, vulnerability, uh, both health, personal health, and uh, position political vulnerability associated with it. Uh, the dictatorial regimes run by individual or individual families are always very vulnerable uh, to uh, this sort of changes, uh, the sort of uh, events that come uh, from, um, you know, they're, they're, they, they feel are not in, in under their control. For many years, Ilham Ali felt like he was in control. Money was coming in. He was deciding where to spend it, where not to spend it, who to put to in, in, in jail, who to release. He was constantly in control of this process. With uh, Armenia uh, and the uh, Nagorno-Karabakh conflict also, uh, basically he decided when to escalate, when to de-escalate. These things have changed over the past year. Uh, the Armenian government is much more um, uh, robust in its responses to uh, his attacks. Uh, in, the, in this situation with the pandemic, he, you know, he does feel much more vulnerable than he ever felt, I think, in uh, what uh, now 17 years of his rule. Well, you know, we, we just, uh, I think you eloquently dealt with the uh, crisis of leadership in Azerbaijan, but, you know, the crisis of leadership, unfortunately, around the world and in the West is, is universal almost. To what extent do you think this today's uh, 
uh, today's Azeri attacks would not have happened in a, in, a, in, a, in a more robust international system where, for example, the U.S. was playing its traditional role as the primary world power uh, and that the, that the EU was far more organized in its uh, political leadership. To what extent is this uh, today's actions as a result of the failures of the Western leadership systems? The Western leadership system always had its limits, but it's, of course, it's never been a crisis like it is right now. That's another uh, huge part of this puzzle. And we have a situation with the uh, Western leadership where uh, literally two days ago, U.S. Embassy in Baku and then in Yerevan issued a warning to its citizens, and the State Department had not made a statement about, you know, encouraging parties to refrain from uh, uh, from an escalation. Uh, this is uh, unprecedented. I think the, uh, in the past we would normally have a statement encouraging parties not to escalate and you know when there is a security situation deteriorating uh, there would be a, an alert to the citizens. So in this case we see especially US government very much disengaged from the situation and uh, this is a predictable uh, course of events considering that how disengaged they have been for many other situations uh, unraveling like this. And uh, uh, this is a, you know, um, a, a, a objective a picture of the United States role in the world today, which is very limited, uh, very inward looking, and very uh, concerned with transactional politics. Well, uh, uh, fortunately, I think everybody uh, on all, all, all people of goodwill obviously want this war to end as quickly as possible. I don't think anything is gained by it, uh, by at least by ordinary people. Uh, but there's outcomes and there's consequences, and uh, in, in every war, there's essentially three possible outcomes. One, you know, there's the possibility of a decisive victory by either party, uh, and then the the third, and I suspect the most likely scenario, is some kind of a unsatisfactory uh, result in which uh, maybe small amounts of territory are exchanged, but nothing dramatic happens. Sort of like what happens in 2016. I want you to go through what each of these scenarios, i.e. a decisive Azeri victory, a decisive Armenian victory, or the most likely scenario, which is some kind of a draw. What would that mean and what would be the consequences of that? Uh, well, unfortunately, the, this war uh, has been conducted in a, in a way that uh, is not, most wars are not conducted in, in, in the sense that all civilians uh, become targets uh, of aggression. Uh, we have the experience of 2016 when Azerbaijani uh, special forces entered just one house in, in Nagorno-Karabakh and killed three elderly people in there, including two elderly women. Uh, that conduct, genocidal conduct, is part of this policy, unfortunately. So any kind of Armenian defeat uh, would result in major humanitarian consequences. And uh, that I'm, I'm sure that informs the robust response by the Armenian government, by the Armenian military to this. Uh, on the other hand, uh, I don't think the, uh, the uh, situation is in that uh, kind of a, a grave situation right now. It, it's, it appears uh, the attack is limited in, uh, in, its, in its scope. It's, it's a much larger attack than 2016 attack. That, that should be kept in mind. Uh, the breadth of attack, the, uh, the depth of attack is much, uh, much more significant than in 2016. And this represents sort of the, the technological edge that the Azerbaijani side has acquired and has appropriated in the last number of years. Uh, so they can now uh, fire, they fired on Stepan Akert, which they haven't done since 1994. And uh, that kind of uh, uh, escalation, of course, demands an Armenian response that is proportionate. And the Armenian military said that they're going to respond proportionately. There is a danger that this tit-for-tat escalation will continue and will engage more cities, more uh, uh, people will be affected by it. Uh, now, uh, you know, that there, is, has, there has to be a robust international response. Uh, I cannot really uh, see much of it coming from the West, unfortunately. Unfortunately, so it most likely will come from Russia, most likely will uh, have some kind of role uh, for Turkey as well, because they will probably try to insert themselves into this process and try to uh, try to uh, uh, basically deliver a small victory for Azerbaijan. That's, that's what's happening. And I see a couple of consequences there. Uh, when you have external player come in and deliver a victory for you, um, you know, you become uh, uh, dependent on this on this player politically and otherwise. So we're seeing uh, basically uh, an early stage of kind of Erdoganization of Azerbaijan. And this is, I think, a major uh, threat to Ilham Aliyev rule, uh, since Turkey has very strong uh, po political uh, popularity in, uh, in Azerbaijan. There are a lot of poor Turkish politicians outside of the, the ruling family. 
Uh, and the uh, relations between Aliyev and Erdogan have never been very close because they're very different people from different type of political backgrounds. Uh, so we can see major consequences for uh, the elite structure in Azerbaijan as a result of this conflict. Yeah, I think a lot of people forget that in, I, I believe it was in 1995 where the Turkish intelligence uh, actually tried to organize a coup against Aliyev's father. So that's uh, true. This yeah. is not the, I mean, this at is least uh, that's what his father's claim. I mean, yeah. That's, uh, belief, at least. Uh, it's uh, one of the things, I mean, I don't know how much of a military analyst you are, but I think uh, this is unfortunately a war that you can see in real time. And uh, I'm certainly not an analyst, but I'm perplexed by the one thing that I do know is in modern warfare, you know, anti-tank weaponry is greatly advanced and uh, tanks are very vulnerable. And we see videos of uh, Azeri tanks lined up like uh, cars in a car dealership being blown up one next to the other. What is the military rationale of an attack in the morning uh, in open field where you have that kind of a vulnerability and you have, you know, you're losing a lot of military material. So I, I don't understand where the logic of this comes from. Obviously, they've spent months and years preparing for this. Uh, do, you, do you have any comments on what that? I'm sure you've seen the same videos that, that I have. Uh, yeah, what happens in this situation? Well, first of all, the picture we're getting is very... Uh, uh, very uh, limited picture, right? It's just a little bit of video here, a little bit of video there, uh, some whatever is released by uh, mostly by the governments, and it's you know they're obviously deciding what to release. Uh, however, what happens? What happened in April 2016, and what is likely to happen this time is that Azerbaijan will try to uh, grab uh, as much territory as little as uh, might be, but whatever they can grab and try to solidify control and try to return to ceasefire and show that as a gain. Um, and uh, in this case they would want to deter Armenia from counterattacking, just as they did in 2016, and trying to return that territory. So what I saw in those little, in a few videos that the Armenian Defense Ministry, the Karabakh Defense Army released, is that uh, initially, uh, as uh, Azerbaijan built up their forces along the, uh, along the line of contact, that was, it looked like it was a deterrent action. Deterrence action, meaning that they were warning Armenian side not to respond with an artillery attack similar that they launched against Stepanakert, or we will attack more and we will try to get more. And the Armenian side just, you know, used the opportunity to degrade some of their capacity on the front line. So that's that's what it looks looked to me like. Obviously, this is a very uh, preliminary analysis. We can't really uh, uh, opine. Another thing that I see in this situation is that even though buildup was very clear over the past couple of months and even the past couple of days with the embassy warnings that I mentioned, uh, the Azerbaijani side did manage to gain the, the element of surprise in terms of the timing of the attack and locations of the attack. Uh, this is, of course, very, very hard to uh, preempt because the way um, the technology that they have, the, you know, the missiles that fly uh, 90, over 100 kilometers, over 200 kilometers, can be launched from areas that are not permanently observed by the Armenian side, further, far away from the front, front line. Um, and that makes it, those standoff weapons m create that possibility of surprise, you know, a permanent possibility of surprise, basically. It's, it's very hard to kind of, unless you have uh, the type of superiority that, you know, that the uh, United States has or some other countries have to kind of watch the situation in a complete way. Even, and even in, uh, you, know, in the, you, you know, United States never has a perfect, p complete picture of a uh, battlefield. So there is this element of surprise, and uh, the Armenian military facilities have been hit. Uh, there has been damage to, to them. Uh, it, it appeared to me that they are particularly focused on the air defense, uh, Armenian air defense. That means that uh, they were doing that in uh, expectation that they would launch an air attack as a follow-up. Uh, and it appears that they have launched the air attack with the drones, etc. So those, uh, that's, the, that's the combined sort of focus uh, of their attack. There's also... Uh, reports of ground attack and uh, uh, possibly several positions captured by uh, Azerbaijani forces. But, you know, that situation is fluid. As we saw in 2016, it can change very quickly, you know, within an hour or two, uh, you know, the tides of uh, fighting can shift. What do you, do you see Armenia escalating on its own side to bring in weapon systems like the Eskandar systems, which can... Yeah, yeah, I mean, everything's true. deployed right now, as far as I understand. Uh, everything's up, uh, you know, everything, everything was deployed in 2016. It depends on a political uh, decision, what to use and when to use it, and whether to escalate or de-escalate. Those are political decisions, and, uh, you know, uh, Nikol Pashinyan is the commander of the Armenian uh, Armed Forces in, in, in wartime as a prime minister, uh, so he will take those decisions. Uh, in, in, in my perspective, I think this... Uh 
this is quite generally regimes like just like the LAF one. You start a war, you better win it decisively. I think this. Uh, uh, what are the possibilities that we might be looking at? That even if it's if it's some kind of a minor victory that they can claim that the reaction to it would be like what happened to the Argentine generals in 82 or the Greek uh, colonels in 1974 where the population essentially says, you know, uh, you're, you're not credible <laughs> on this issue and you can claim victory all you want, but we don't see it. You know, we're, we're not going yeah, back for it. What we saw in 2016 is a, a big buildup in patriotic emotions in Azerbaijan, and this is going to happen again now, but um, uh, in, in Azerbaijan, general overall a sense at the end was of dissatisfaction because the, there were major casualties that they suffered, but they didn't really accomplish anything tangible. Uh, this time around, it seems like uh, Azerbaijani government, uh, the uh, Aliyev uh, specifically, is looking for ways to limit as much as possible their casualties. Uh, this is why we hear of the allegedly the, the, the Syrian mercenaries being brought. Uh, much more reliance on standoff weaponry, on drones, just even more than more so than uh, in uh, in April 2016. Of course, you know drones were used then, but much more limited way. Um, so that, you know, if he in the end says, well, we didn't really have major casualties, they didn't really attack our cities, but we managed to really shake them up and get something. Uh, that would be seen as a victory by by Azerbaijan because they're just like Armenians are very sens they're they're very sensitive to their uh, uh, casualties to their uh, you know uh, soldiers dying like you know uh, any small country would be uh, sensitive so that's what uh, um, uh, this kind of uh, situation is developing in, is like like right now uh, it can develop into something else because like I said with major players coming in and trying to uh, uh, re, you know, reinsert themselves or insert themselves in this situation. Turkey might pursue a role. You know, wants to have a another chip to to trade with uh, Russia. Uh, you know, Russia is behind in the, in the, sort of in the Turkey's backyard in Syria, and Turkey might want to be in uh, Russia's backyard in Azerbaijan. So uh, that's that that situation is building. Of course, big uh, question is what's going to be Russian reaction. We just saw in the last few days major military exercise by Russia. And for the first time that I remember, they practiced invading Azerbaijan. Yeah, and I will. We have done that before, you know, with the, the amphibious assault. assault and uh, you can think of scenarios where Russians say, oh, this is a great opportunity to just go, go grab those oil fields and gas fields and just add them to Gazprom and, uh, or, you know, Rosneft and make them part of that. And, uh, you know, uh, with the situation as it is right now with a major energy crisis and cash crunch for these companies, they've kind of already done some things like that. You know, they've basically... Uh, found ways to reintegrate some of the private companies into the, into the state, uh, and this can, this is like a private Aliyev company that they might want to reintegrate into Russian uh, Russian system. So uh, that's that's where the unpredictable situation might uh, might might develop. Uh, we will see what happens, uh, but uh, you know those are sort of the general scenarios that I see. Well, Emil, we appreciate your time and thank you for joining us. Thank you very much. Uh, good luck to everybody.